there's been some confusion in between the generations. We always like to bicker over which generation is the best. Well, my generation is the best because we had real music. Um, I mean, there's an argument to be made there. Um, well, my generation is better because we're better on technology. That's not wrong. And so, so there's, there's this whole list of things where we could make an argument for every generation and why their generation is the best. But what we see is that Jesus said for every generation to come to him. He, when he said, bring the children to me. He said, let them come to me. When, when, they, when everybody else was trying to push them out and, and, and leave them alone and, and, and not let them get to Jesus, he said, no, no, no. Let them come unto me. And what we see is that it's kind of like the, the moment. How many of you all have ever had, had a, a, at restaurants or maybe at Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner, you have a kid's table and an adult's table? Well, last week the whole big deal is that at God's table, there's not a kid's in or an adult's in. We're all together. Yeah. And, and, and being all together, we have to understand as adults that, it, that it's not our moment it's now their moment. But in order to make it their moment, we've got to do what we're going to talk about today, and that's mentoring. That's developing, that's training up kids. And training them up in the way that they should go. And it's found scripturally. But one of the things that I think that we hear often is, how many of y'all have ever heard somebody say, if I just had someone to walk alongside of me? Anybody? Maybe you've said that yourself. And you know what? I, I just, I really need some people to walk along with me right now. This, the things that I'm going through, the struggles that I'm facing, the, the fight that I'm having to go through, I just, I need somebody to walk with me. And, and that's, that is so true. Because when we say that we are better together, biblical principle is that we were made for relationships. We were made to be together. And when we're separate, there's something missing. Uh, there, there's something that's not there. So, so we always see this. But this morning, we're going to walk through. If you have your Bibles, I would say turn in them, but we are going to jump around a lot today. They are going to be up on the screens. But we're going to first start out in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, where, where we get to see this. Uh, it's kind of a sad thing take place. What we see is that Moses... Um, and Moses did a fantastic job of setting up the next generation. How many of you all know that Moses actually never made it to the promised land? But he trained up the leader that was going to get the Israelites to the promised land. And so he was really good at training up the next set of generational leaders. But what we see is, then, and, and that was Joshua, but what Joshua kind of failed at, and Joshua wasn't necessarily that type of a person that trained the next generation. And so what we see is there's, there's a lot of things that, that kind of falls off here because he wasn't, he, he wasn't doing the, the process of mentoring or, or building someone up that was going to come after him. So what we see is Judges 2.10, it says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. What I say? Fathers. Normally we talk about one. But we're going to get to that today. It goes on, it says, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. So the sad thing is, is when we don't build that the next leader or the next generation behind us, they don't they don't know. And what ends up happening is, is, if we're talking about this generational type of argument or fight, what, what we see is that why would they know if we haven't done our part in, in teaching them or in mentoring them, training them up? And, and, and so what, if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this one down. I, I don't think I included it on our, on our slides. But one of the things I want you to write down is that everyone needs a Paul and everyone needs a Timothy in their life. Everyone. 
No matter who you are, no matter what generation you're in, no matter how old, no matter how young, everyone needs a Paul and everyone needs a Timothy. What that simply means is that you need someone that you can look up to and you need people that can look up to you. Because that's what that is. So Paul was the guy that Timothy looked up to. So Paul had Timothy looking up to him. He was able to train someone up. He was able to build some, that next generational leader up. And it's one of those things where we get to see this whole thing just expand. They're actually talking about it today. And, and kids, they're walking through how the expansion of, of, of just how people getting saved and people coming to know Christ happens. It, it starts with one person. And then that one person goes and gets two, and then those two people go get two more people. So it just it just keeps on exponentially adding up. But what ends up happening is it has to start with the first person. Going and, and, and being able to understand that, hey, I, I might be older. They might be younger. I'm kind of a little dumber at times. And I've got to do my part in pouring what my knowledge is, what I know, the things that I have been trained in, and pouring it into their life so that they can continue the process afterwards. Because in life, we're not going to be here for forever. But life doesn't end when we're gone. It keeps going on. And so if... If that process doesn't keep occurring where we keep building up leaders, there will eventually run out of leaders in our world. And so when we say that it's their time, it's their time because, because life is constantly changing. Now, how do we do that? How do we as people that maybe look at the next generation and go, really? I have to, I, I have to train them. Because I've even said it before. There's been moments in my life where, for me, it was when I was in high school, I can remember um, going and umpiring um, baseball, t-ball games, and I can remember saying to myself, these kids are no good. I can remember when I played t-ball, we were knocking it out of the park. They can't even knock it out of the infield. What has happened to them? Well, I went to myself parents these days. They just let them sit inside and play on PlayStation and Xbox all day long, so they don't know what it's like to hit a baseball. Of course they wouldn't hit one out of the park. I've heard the same thing though from people older than me. So it's a thing that constantly happens. And, and, and so we have to at some point grab a hold of that and go, no, 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 no. I have to take it I have to take it for myself. See, what, what, what you have to understand is that Next week, next week's Mother's Day. Mothers in the room, we are going to celebrate you big time. But I also want to say women in the room that have any influence over anyone, I want to celebrate you as well. Because I know that sometimes Mother's Day is not always the easiest to some people. But I think at some point in time, and we're going to talk about this today, is that Sometimes a mother figure in the room can come from someone that just has influence in your life. And so one of the first things we're going to start with is how can you do this? How can you be a person that trains up that next generation? Men in the room, you're first. Being a spiritual father in their life. Amen. That, is a, that is a duty of a man that is a Christian that should be something that we take on it is weight. It is a weighty thing that we get to take on. But as, as a Christian man, that, that is something that we get to do. Amen. We get to build up this next generation by providing them someone to look up to and going, that, that's how a father should be. That's how a father should look. That's how a father should talk. That's how a father should love his wife. That's how a father should work hard. I mean, I can keep going on if you'd like me to. It says it right here, 1 Corinthians 4, 15 through 17. It says, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This is Paul talking to the church of Corinth. He 
He says, even, even though you have your father, I, be, I became your father in Christ. I urge you, then be imitators of me. That is why I send you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. See, being a spiritual father doesn't replace the biological father. That won't happen. But it adds to it. It, it, it supplements, if you will. See, a supplement is something that, that it allows you to, if we're talking about like the, the sports world or the, or the health world, a supplement that you take adds to what you already have. Am I right? If you're taking vitamin supplements, it's going to add vitamins that your body currently already produces, but you're adding to it. If you have a father... You should have a spiritual father simply from the fact that it adds to what you're able to learn from the people that you surround yourself with. Um, I, I did a little word study. The, the, the word guardians, the root word is podagogos, which means servant who takes a child to school. That's not what we would have ever thought guardian means. Am I, am I the only one that thought that? Okay, good. When I looked this up, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it even goes as far to say a, it could be a tutor or an instructor. So this word guardian doesn't necessarily mean the thing that I think maybe we always put with it. But it's an instructor. Someone who trains someone, builds them up, teaches them the knowledge that they have. That's what this word guardian means. Maybe, I love what Paul says, maybe, not, maybe you don't have many fathers. See, because Timothy was this way. Maybe you don't have many fathers. But you've got a great, you have a great grandmother. You've got a wonderful mom. You need a spiritual father in your life. And, and what they get to do is they get to imitate the things that, that the spiritual fathers are teaching them so that they can do the ways that Christ has taught that spiritual father. The imitation. I, I think we have a picture for you uh, of my son imitating me. One of the greatest days of my life. Yes, that is right up there. Don't tell Whitney. With our wedding. With the birth of them. It was great for me. That Camden has talked about since he could talk going hunting with me. And this last fall, I got to finally take him. And one of the things that he said while we were sitting there is, I get to hunt just like that. And I know that's just hunting. But it's, the, it's that process of imitating. And, and how much it means to them when they can imitate someone that they look up to. It, it means something. It means something to the person that's being imitated. Believe me. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for the sun to go down because I was loving it. Even though he's three years old. I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. If we see anything, we probably won't kill it because he's going to go crazy. But he was great. Dad failed because he forgot snacks. <laughs> <laughs> but it was awesome. We got to have this moment of of him getting to do something that he's always seen me do. Second thing, women in the room. What do you think it's going to be? Be a spiritual what? Mother. Yeah, be a spiritual mother. If you're a woman in the room, that is, that's your duty. That, that's, that's your job. That's the way that you get to carry it. That's the, that's, the, that's the thing that God has entrusted you to do. As a, as a woman of Christ, you get to show younger women what it looks like. How to treat yourself. How to, how to think about yourself. I know no women in the room have ever thought bad about themselves, right? <laughs> um, how to love someone. How to, how to show love. I mean, the list can go on. How, how, to, how to raise up children 
And, and so, so we see these things unfold, and, 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 and all of these, uh, and each, each, each male, each female have this responsibility as Christians. That as the younger generation looks up to us, that, that we get to be spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers, and, and it can all be found. Titus 2, 3-5, through 5, it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be re re revealed, reviled. There you go. What that means is so that it's not taken, it's not taken in a different way. It's, it's not being abused. So that the word of God isn't being abused. That's, that's, that's what spiritual mothers need to do. And they get to teach young women how to love their husbands, even when their husbands young. <laughs> we mess up. We forget anniversaries, we forget birthdays and all that good stuff. They teach them how to how to love them through them. See, it's, a, it's actually in a song. There's a there's a lady at some point in time that said to country star Miranda Lambert, I'm gonna read it so I get it correct. Fix your makeup, girl. It's just a breakup. <laughs> right? How many of y'all have ever had a woman in your life, women in the room, ever say, Hey, get past him, it's just a boy. you got to have people in your life that at some point in time can be that real with you. Hey, come on, you got to get back on track. Don't, don't, we're not going to throw this pity party. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> but then you also have to have, there's, there's, Special, special place for the for the spiritual mother who can say, "Hey, come on, fix your makeup, pull up your bootstraps, let's move on." But then at the same point in time, no one to tell you, "You are my sunshine." I'm all about songs during this series, I guess. But it, but it's a time where you can have the sweetness, the tender, loving care. But also the the hard thing that needs to be told, because what, what we what we've ended up seeing is we've ended up seeing broken marriages, we've ended up seeing broken relationships, we've ended up seeing brokenness, all because it's been something that they've seen the generation before them, and the generation before, and the generation before. I'm not saying it's the generation before's problem that they're having an issue. But I am saying that the generation lower than us is watching everything the generation before us is doing. And so if we want to see a cycle end, we talk about this often, seasons are from God, cycles are man-made. Seasons change naturally by the hand of God, cycles take a decision to get out of. So if we want to see a cycle change throughout our life, throughout our world, if we want to see broken marriages become restored, if we want to see that stuff come to an end, they have to see a decision be made on the front end. It's something that is crucial. It's crucial. I... Can I be real with you for a second? Since being a pastor... I have never I never knew how much brokenness there was. I was a pretty good kid. I, I, believe me, I messed up a lot. I was a pretty good kid. My parents are still married after going on third. Oh my goodness, we gotta celebrate. It's almost the 30th year. <coughs> But, but it's one of those things where I, I, I've seen people 
go through that. But to see my people have to go through that. To see the sheep of my flock have to go through the, the heartache and the brokenness. I didn't know what that was like. And it's something to see that happen. It's something to see the hurt when, when what they need is they, they need to be shown. When they need to be shown, what, is, what does that actually look like to not go through that? What does it look like to not have to experience that? That's, that's what we get to do. That's what we get to show the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Third thing. How do, how do we how do we get to do this? So you're going to go, what do you mean? You just told us that we have to be spiritual fathers and mothers. But we also we also have we, we do this by being Timothy's. Because there's nothing more rewarding than seeing someone that is older than yourself learning something. Looking up to someone else being spiritual sons and or daughters. And, and, and so what we get to see this is uh, how do we become Timothy's? Well, we first you need to define what you're looking for. If, 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 you're, if, you're, if you're looking for something, you have to be intentional about what you're looking for. If, if you're, a, if you're a, a couple that is about to be getting married or you're a couple that wants to be married, who are you surrounding yourself with? Are you surrounding yourself with a mess? Or are you surrounding yourself with a, with a godly married couple to show you how that looks? What it looks like? How it can be? Are, are you a brand new Christian? Maybe this doesn't have to do with age. Maybe it has to do with where you are spiritually. Are you a brand new Christian? Well, guess what? There are people in our church right now that are very mature in their faith, that would love to take you under their wing, no matter how old or how young you are, and they would love to show you what being a Christian looks like. Maybe it's the fact, maybe it's something just as simple as you're starting a business. Maybe you have a dream, a desire to start something new, but you don't know where to begin. Go have lunch with somebody that has done it before you. Be intentional about it. Ask them to lunch. Ask them over for dinner. Do something so that you can learn what, what, it, what did you have to go through? How hard was it for you? What were the steps that you took in order to start a new business, to, to do something different, to, to do something you've never done before? What were the, what were the things and, the, and the, the steps that you had to take to get there? That's how we become... Timothy. We become a Timothy by asking questions. We become a Timothy by listening. We become a Timothy by taking notes. I'm, I'm a true believer that if you're wanting to learn, if you're wanting to grow, you have to, you have to ask questions. Ask all the questions you want. I'm a question asker like none other. But it's because I love to learn. But if you ask a question, ask what you want to learn. If you ask a question, listen. If you ask a question, you better make sure that you have a way to write it down or a way to remember it. Because if you ask a question that you want to learn and you don't ever remember it, what did you learn? Sixteen twenty-nine through 30 it says, And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Another person, Silas, or another person that Paul developed. 30, he goes on and he says, And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He asked exactly what he wanted to know. He asked the person that could tell him exactly what he wanted to know. Don't ask people that don't know. If 
you're looking for an answer and you're asking someone without the answer, what are you going to learn? Nothing. Second thing, how do we become Timothy's? We practice what we see. We practice what we see. Philippians 4, 9, it says, For you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Surround yourself with the people that you need to see how to get to where you want to be. It's a, it's a pretty easy principle. It's a pretty easy principle. If you see people doing the things that you want to do, being the things that you want to be, watch them. Learn from them. Practice their ways. If you're close enough to them, guess what they'll also do? They'll speak into your life about your goals, about your dreams, and how to get there. Then you've got to go right back to the number one and listen. Ask questions and take notes. Third thing that you can do to become a Timothy is show honor. Romans 12, 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You can always make room. You can always, you can always make more money. But guess what you can't make more, more of? Time. You cannot make more time. You see, God always, always, always honors honor. If you are honoring someone, he's going to honor you. That means showing up on time. That means uh, coming prepared. That means taking notes. That means serving the person who you're wanting to receive something from. But let's be real. How many of us actually want to hear that sometimes? Sometimes we, we slide over, we, we, kind of, we kind of hide from what's real. We kind of hide from what someone's saying to us because we don't want to hear it. We want to learn, we want to grow, we want to, we want to get there someday, but we, won't, we, don't want to, we don't want to hear the truth when it hurts. Am I right? But guess what? There are, no, matter, no matter what it is, no matter where, where you're at in life, no matter what you've done, if you want to be a better mom, if you want to be a business leader who leads their business like a Christ-like, if you want to be a better athlete, no matter where you're at in life, no matter what you're doing, it takes that. It takes people in your life that's going to speak realness. Maybe that sounds a little harsh at times. It's going to take someone that's going to have that sweet spirit. They can... They can edify you just by, by, the, by the encouragement, by their gentleness. It, it takes both. It, it, it takes both of those people. You see, how many of you would say in your life that you've overcome something? Perfect. Quite a few of you. How many in your room, in this room right now, would say you need to overcome something? All you overcomers in the room, there's people that need you. There's people that need you to speak into their life. There's people that need you to come alongside of them. There's people that need you to be real with them. How did you get over it? How did you move past it? How did you get on to the next thing? How did you how did you break the chains and the bondage? Uh, of feeling, feeling ashamed, feeling regret, feeling the guilt, feeling worried. How did you move past that? They, they need you. How do we become Paul? How do we become a Paul in someone's life? See, Pauls are the spiritual fathers and the spiritual mothers. That's that's the person that has people looking up to them. How do you become that? First thing is you have to be an example. You have to be an example in the way that you live. And being a role model. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's one thing for you to say something. It's another thing for someone to watch you do something. Because you can say all you want. But until someone sees you do it, or until someone sees you do the exact 
exact opposite of what you say. They either believe you more or believe you less. And that's a big thing. Second thing, you can tell stories. I love sitting down with older generations and hearing the stories of the past. One of my favorite things about being in sales, just getting to experience the things that they experience, getting to hear about their stories, getting to hear about the things that they went through, getting to hear how uh, this large farming operation became, how it, how it became. It started out with a, a horse or a mule and a walk behind plow. And now they've got thousands of acres. And that is a story that needs to be told. Psalms 145, 4 through 6, it says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on the wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They don't, they don't hear you declaring the greatness that God has had in your life. How will they ever know what greatness looks like? When we become a Paul in someone's life, whether that's a spiritual mother or a spiritual father, they have to see us giving God the glory. They have to see us living that out, but they have to hear us give God the glory in which is due to Him so that they can see what greatness looks like. Third thing, to become a Paul, share your life. Share your life. We were meant to be together. We were meant to be together. If we are better together and we're not together, then we're not better. We're alone. And in loneliness, where the enemy attacks the most. When you have somebody walking alongside of you, if I had to guess, there's probably multiple people in this room that would say, I'm going through something right now. Whether it's an illness, whether it's a broken relationship, whether it's, it's grief, whether, whether it's sadness, whether it's maybe you're wrong. Maybe it's, maybe it's on the good side of things. Hey, uh, I, I'm wanting to do something great. How can I do it? I'm wanting to start something new. I, I feel like God's calling me in a different direction. What does that look like? Can you, can you walk with me through this so that I can learn, so that I can develop, so that I can be who God has called me to be? And I've seen you do it all my life. That's when you've got to come alongside us. And... And as they're plowing the ground, they're holding one handle of the plow, you get to hold the other handle of the plow. You can say, we're going to do this together. You're not, you no longer have to do this alone. We're going to do this together. And understand that it doesn't matter which generation you're in. It doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. We're better together. We are better together because God created us to be together. We've got to understand, at the end of the day, all of us, young, better old, have to have Paul's in our life, someone to look up to, someone to lean on, someone to tell us right from wrong at times. Am I right? Someone to straighten us out. Say, hey, I don't think that's the direction that you need to go. I, I don't, hey. You might want to be careful with that decision. But you also need Timothy's. All of us need Timothy's. We need someone looking up to us, learning from us, hearing from us, being the model in their life. It's a big responsibility, it's a big task. It carries weight. But it's something that is so awesome to get to see. One of the things that I love as a pastor that you get to see is you get to see people 
taking this next step. I need to see people being dunked in some water. Because we need to see them taking the next step. It's the seeds that have been so sowed that have finally get to come to fruition. See, what, it, what is so hard, what I think holds some people back from being called, or what hurts sometimes when you're appalled, is that we want to see the fruit so bad that when sometimes we don't get to see the fruit, we decide we don't want to be appalled anymore. We decide, hey, you know what? Uh, I guess I didn't do anything because they didn't turn out very well. Or I, I guess I didn't do anything good because I didn't see the fruit from what, from what I did. Sometimes the fruit that they will become isn't for us to see, but it was for us to plant the seed. And that, that is something so great. That's the opportunity and the responsibility that we have is to plant seeds and believe that God is going to prepare the harvest. Because remember what we talked about a few weeks ago, is it's God's harvest, not ours. When it becomes our harvest, that's when the harvest isn't bountiful. When it's kept as God's harvest, that's when it's plentiful. It's over and abundant. Running over. When, when the storerooms and the grain bins can't fill it, they can't keep a hold of it anymore. That's because it's God's harvest, not ours. This morning, I want to give you all the opportunity. I want to give you the opportunity, one, to pray. If you need to come up here, you need to pray. These altars are always open. Uh, if, if you're a person in the room that needs someone, that needs someone to walk alongside of you, I want to give you that moment. Know how? Well, be intentional. If you see somebody that's walking in a way that you want to walk, be intentional. If you want to be a Paul in the room, if you want to be a spiritual mother or father in the room, be attentive. Look, there's people all around that, that need someone like that. One of the things for us is when we, we moved here, we moved away from family, we moved to a town where most people are related. It is, it, it can be tough. You want to be a part of the family. Well, in this room, in our church, I hope that everyone feels a part of the family. Because we've got Pauls in this room, and we've got Timothys in this room, and I hope to be somewhere in between I love to be a Timothy to the Pauls in my life. And I love to be the Pauls to the Timothys in my life. So let's pray. 